great to see you all. Hi, thank you so much for coming. Um, I'm David Gersten. I'm the director of Arts, Letters, and Numbers. And, uh, and I want to welcome you all uh, to this uh, really wonderful event. This is, uh, we're holding this in collaboration with the Design Center at UCOM in Montreal, uh, Canada. And I want to um, really thank my dear friend, Louise uh, Pelletier, the director of the Design Center, for bringing such a, an important uh, discussion to our exhibition in the 17th uh, Venice Architecture Biennale. So, Ikran Total, Total Screen. This is our uh, first uh, panel discussion that we are hosting um, as part of the programming within uh, the BNL. And uh, we have many more programs coming over the next weeks and months. Uh, but I, I have to say that I am very moved that we are beginning here with, uh, with this program tonight. And I say that for a few reasons. First, for the sort of immediate and very present uh, condition of the total screen states that uh, we have all been uh, living, and, you know, in some ways for many decades, and, uh, and of course in, in other ways, uh, these uh, screen states have really been heightened in the, the recent uh, year. And I believe that the, the questions that the uh, exhibition raises and I'm sure the panel will be engaging tonight are, are crucial to our understanding and imagination in fact, of our screens, of our, our broken screens and um, our broken society. In fact. Um, so I also want to share that uh, since the time I was a, a young student and uh, teacher at the Cooper Union, the work of Jean Baudrillard has uh, had a, a profound impact on, uh, on my thinking and on that of many in my uh, generation. And it continues to, I mean, in many ways, its impact, um, in fact, increases with each year. Um, so I believe it is extremely important that we engage uh, this work and questions. In, uh, in a creative way and in a present tense uh, ways, which the exhibition uh, at the Design Center and in fact the event this evening are, are clearly uh, doing that. Um, and finally, I wanna say um, that I'm, I'm very moved that we begin this uh, Venice Biennale project in collaboration with uh, Louise Pelletier and the Design Center. Louise has been a dear friend for many years and I would also have to say that for decades, she has been a force, uh, both creating and transforming uh, the discourses of architecture. Uh, Louise's uh, depth of, of intellect, her precision, and, and ultimately her generosity of, of spirit um, has always been an inspiration. And uh, her contributions to the debates and cultures of architecture have been enormous. Um, so I can think of no one that I would rather uh, begin this journey with. And so thank you, Louise. Uh, welcome to all. And I really look forward to uh, continuing to learn from you this evening. Thank you, Louise. Thank you so much, David. Um, it's very touching. I'm, I'm extremely grateful for your very kind words. Um, I'm, I'm also uh, very grateful, well, uh, I've always admired your work and uh, I've seen uh, the project of Elin evolve over the years and it has taken a tremendous um, importance and place uh, in, um, in this kind of experimentation and uh, exploring uh, the limit uh, of what architecture work can be. And, and I'm, I'm extremely grateful to you uh, for this invitation to uh, join this discussion and join uh, this grand project uh, of, um, of being part of this virtual uh, pavilion for uh, the Biennale. Uh, so so uh, an enormous thank you for allowing us to be, uh, to be part of it. Um, I, I would like to start um, 
Well, first by acknowledging uh, that the lands on which the UCAM Design Center is located are part of an ancestral territory that has long served as a place of life, meeting and exchanges between indigenous people, in particular, the nation Ganyon Gehaga uh, Mohawk. We recognize that these nations have never ceded their rights or sovereign authority over the lands and water upon which the exhibition that we will discuss tonight uh, was produced. Um, what is interesting to me uh, in being part of this event um, is also related to the very topic of this year's, uh, this year, uh, Venice Architecture Biennale. Um, in fact, the topic for the Biennale is togetherness. It's a central theme, and yet uh, the manner in which we interact with each other uh, is unquestionably the aspect of our life that has been most dramatically and directly impacted uh, by the current situation that has affected, has impacted the, the last 15 months. Um, in the design of an exhibition, uh, in particular, this, this longing for real presence uh, has been exacerbated by the imposed isolation that plagues us still today. Um, on the one hand, various forms of mediation uh, through the omnipresence of screen that David was uh, obviously referring to, have allowed people uh, from all over the world to gather in different places, but at a share moment in time. And this is precisely uh, what allows us tonight uh, to bring together people from Montreal, from Avril Park, from New York City, Venice, from all over the world. Uh, and, and it's in fact a direct result of uh, this unusual situation uh, that has been created by the pandemic. As designer, artist, but also as architect, such shifting condition must be engaged. And this is precisely uh, what we try to do with this exhibition, Total Screen. Um, the, the modes of interaction that demand uh, that we look through screens uh, of all sorts in order to truly see each other. And I'm, I'm very much looking forward to, um, to the talk with Penelope uh, Umbrico today, because this is precisely one of the issues that she addresses through her work in a very uh, magistral way. The exhibition that was produced at the, the UCAM Design Center addresses these issues of the omnipresence of screen. And as David mentioned, it, it's, it draws from uh, Jean Baudrillard's seminal work, uh, his text, Ecran Total, which was translated as Screened Out uh, in English, first published in 1997. Uh, that became really the, the source, the inspiration and the guiding line for the, uh, the total screen uh, exhibition uh, at the Design Center that presents the work of seven established and emerging artists, including uh, Penelope, um, who is joining us today, tonight, uh, but also the work of uh, Adam Bassenta, Charlie Doyon, Clint Enns, uh, Mishka Henner, and um, uh, Vassem Bhatti, um, as well as uh, Juan G. Uh, the exhibition uh, that we develop, and, and in a moment, uh, my colleague, uh, Katarina Nemeyer, will tell you more about it. Uh, the exhibition offers uh, different forms of mediation, in fact, three distinct experiences of mediation that articulate critically these um, this ideas of Baudrillard around the concept of the viral simulation, surveillance, implosion. Um, and um, and uh, I, I will invite uh, Katarina to, to tell us more about how the, the whole project developed. Um, then um, the, this, this discussion will be followed by a presentation and a discussion around the work of uh, Penelope Umbrico uh, and my colleagues, uh, 
two colleagues from the School of Design, Amandine Alessandra and Carole Lévesque. Um, I take the opportunity to uh, remind you that uh, if some of you have a question uh, throughout the discussion tonight, uh, and specifically uh, when, uh, when Penelope will be uh, discussing her work, um, I would invite you to use the, the chat box to um, share your questions and uh, will be happy to relay them uh, throughout uh, the evening. So uh, first, let me uh, introduce um, this, my colleague, Katharina Nemeyer, uh, who's a professor uh, at UCAM in the School of Media. She's also the director of uh, a very, very important uh, research center, the Centre de Recherche Culturelle et Société de CELA. Uh, she was trained in cultural science and media archaeology and philosophy as well as in communication science. Her work focuses on the relationship between media and digital technologies, temporalities, memory and history. Um, I'm very pleased to uh, welcome uh, Katarina to tell us more about how the, the whole exhibition the whole idea of an exhibition around Baudria, his theory and his practice as a photographer came about. Um, thank you very much, uh, Louise, for this introduction. And thank you very much. I'm speaking also in the name of Marine Baudria tonight and also Marguerite Miul, uh, who couldn't join us. She's also a co-curator. Um, thank you very much, David, the VR Arts Letters and Numbers to that we can like be with you on this sunship together. Uh, during the Biennale in Venice, even if it's virtually. So thank you very much for that. Uh, I will more or less read because I'm not trained to speak English every day um, and will also share my screen uh, if you don't mind. So I will, um, I will start uh, by sharing my screen for the presentation. And if everything is Zoom is like it was when we tested it. Uh, you should see very quickly a total screen. <laughs> Does it work? Okay, wonderful. So before talking um, about Jean Baudrillard's uh, philosophy and photography, I wish to remind some key elements of his life, but also thank uh, Marine Baudrillard, who uh, herself is a uh, professional photographer who gave us access to original archive material of her husband and who supported the whole adventure from far away as a co-curator of the exhibition. Jean Baudrillard, a thinker, provocateur, uh, and philosopher of hyperreality and simulation, taught sociology in France at the universities of Nanterre and Dauphine until 1968. Apart from his visionary lucidity, he was also a photographer, often capturing images with a disposable camera. Some of his photographic work has been exhibited in Sydney at the Museum of Contemporary Art in Australia in 1994, um, La Maison Européenne de la Photographie in France in 2001, a castle in the Kunsthalle Friderizianum, Germany in 2004, Los Angeles, Le Chateau Sato uh, uh, in 2017, and also in Shanghai at the Power Station of Art in China in 2019, and now in Montreal. In his own words, Jean Baudrillard encapsulates his trajectory as follows. And they show some pictures uh, that has never been shared uh, by archive pictures from Marine Baudrillard of, of her husband. Um, he, he talked about himself as being a pathophysician at 20, situationist at 30, utopian at 40, at 40, transversal at 50, viral and metaleptic at 60, the whole of my history. <laughs> Among his many works are the consumer society, myth and structures, symbolic exchange and death, Cool Memories, as well as Ecran Total, or Screened Out, translated into English in 90, uh, from 1996, a collection of essays, which is the subject of this ex exhibition, as Louise already reminded us earlier. So, from viral implosions to deserts, deserts of the real. This is a guiding line since the beginning of the total screen adventure, which has started in 2018 bringing Jean Baudrillard's photographs the first time to Canada was Magali Earl's idea while we were walking to our university offices. Walking brings ideas <laughs> sometimes. So uh, as I knew Marine Baudrillard for, for a longer time already, and uh, as I was a member of the Cool Memory Association in Paris, the idea has not just stayed an idea, as you can see today uh, via your screens. 
Initially, uh, the total screen uh, exhibition intended already to exhibit, uh, exhibit Baudrillard's photographic work and philosophy in dialogue with contemporary artists, aiming to critically engage with our relations to screens in a world that has already been characterized before the pandemic by different type, types of ecological and social emergencies, as well as by an overwhelming presence of digital technologies and social media platforms in our everyday lives. The materiality of media in a large sense in relation to current emergencies is more relevant than ever, but this point of departure for the total screen exhibition has been almost completely overrun by the pandemic situation. At the same time, the letter ironically captures and implodes in a nutshell the main concept Jean Baudrillard already pointed out decades ago in his visionary texts, mainly in the 60s and 70s that the near future will be characterized by simulation, virality, implosion, and surveillance, the loss of signs and significations in the growing production of artificial meanings and the subsequent longing for something else. The French philosopher who passed away in 2007 used to be a melancholic optimist believing in the return of singularity. Without ever falling into a dualistic approach of what reality could have been, or might be, or will never be. In this sense, his ideas may offer a link between media as materials of simulation and as materials of retaining hope for a singular real. I think Penelope Umbrico's work is also a testimony for that. Baudrillard turned his own writings into a seductive simulation machine that still plays with our conceptions of reality. This is a proposition one can accept and flow with, refuse from the outset or oscillate undecidedly between approval and disapproval. As co-curators, we find ourselves somewhere in between. Oscillating between our desire to push the simulation machine even further and our inclination to interrogate what our place, what place Jean Baudrillard occupies today, or place too, but this is another question. Provocative, eclectic, ironic, playful, and anticipatory, Baudrillard thinking propels both the image and the medium of photography, and that which evades them into a dimension that inspires, questions, amazes, and disturbs. 30 years after 1991, when he argued that the Gulf War uh, was never, uh, has never happened, in an attempt to demonstrate the extent to which the society of the image has deviated from an already vanished reality. And 20 years after 9-11, when he referred to the destructions of the Twin Towers in 2001 on live television as a sym symbiotic apex between experience and its image. His conception of the image, of its forms and of its plasticity remain resolutely contemporary, which is also reminded by the work from uh, Wazim Bati and Mishke Henna, by the way, you will discover later. More powerful than its own presence in the reality that it renders less real and confined to endless media feedback, the image has become an event and the event an image. The philosopher's writing certainly illustrate the force of his visionary view of society that followed his death in 2007 and whose vision has nevertheless encompassed the dominance of simulacra, transparency and hyperreality, the injunction of computer code, the variety of communications and the implementation of artificial intelligence each of which are profound present day issues that permeate his work from beginning to end. If Baudrillard's philosophy was supposed to be irrelevant after his death in 2007, it nevertheless persists and resurfaces in the criticism of our present time, especially with regard to the supremacy of images in a society that has become a total screen. I just take a bit water from the sea just behind, next to the boat. Um, it would be equally in a, inadequate to ignore COVID-19 in light of Baudrillard's systematic and sometimes debatable reflections on virality and its relationship to disaster and chaos. In fact, he perceived the individual as, and I quote Baudrillard, the chosen terrain for viruses and viral diseases, just as computers become the chosen terrain for electronic viruses. For viruses resist and proliferate as soon as they have free space. Total screen, 1969. Moreover, it is crucial to take a critical look at the screen, which since the early spring of 220 has become our almost only communicative interface with the world. 
national and international news, shopping, domestic and social, as well as cultural activities, sports and online games, as well as the consumption of fiction and various platforms, to name a few examples. This is especially relevant considering what we invest, uh, that we invest our professional, private and social lives in the screen, including our most intimate moments, but also our creative moments and artwork, the Sunship today we are all on, uh, which is gathering. Uh, this, uh, this event is only one example. And Total Screen is also invested in material and virtual arcs, an arc between Baudrillard's photographic work, his philosophy, and the artworks of the exhibition. And I will now present the part of Magali, who couldn't join us today. So um, I, I can't imitate her voice, but just imagine that Magali is talking <laughs> at my place. So as I just said, Baudrillard is considered as a visionary. He offered the sharp, analysis of the relationship between image and reality, even more relevant in the current pandemic context where the screen interface is overwhelming. At a time when the explosive evolution of our visual practices relies the transformation of our relationship to images, the total screen exhibition explores the screen as an interface, as we already said about simulation, surveillance, explosion, and virality. As this concept developed by Baudrillard are embodied in his own photographic practice that is firmly anchored in his time before the advent of Web 2.0, the exhibition proposes to update these main motives, themes, and approaches critically in the face of contemporary technologies and uncertainties. The philosopher's photographic snapshots share the stage and the screens with the installations of four invited international artists. Louise already named them, uh, so and uh, Madine will talk a lot to talk about them, so I don't want to take too much space, so I won't re-quote them. But all of them, critically and reflectively, expand on and rethink the philosopher's observations and intuitions for the digital age and its exponential multiplication of images as well as their virality. Through photographs, projections, and installations, the Total Screen Exhibition features three distinct experiences of mediation. The first one is a very real physical exhibition at the center of the design, which are installations where the installations seem to wait in quiet contemplation alongside the images of Jean Baudrillard and flanked by his aphorisms. As you can see at the entrance point, the artworks, descriptions, and credits are aligned together on different screens, so the visitor is invited to walk forth and back as in a hypertext on the web or to say it with Baudrillard's words. There is no separation any longer, no empty space, no absence. You enter the screen and the visual image unhindered. You enter your life as you would walk on to a screen. You slip on your own life like a data suit. 1996, uh, screened out. Uh, Amandina Alessandra will detail the artworks later. So just take a quiet look at the following pictures of this first mediation. Uh, we can share more later in the chat with the link. I will share them, but I have too many screens open, so I don't want to interrupt the presentation that works so far technically. Um, the second mediation is an outdoor installation. At the center of the design, where the exhibit pieces are revealed in all their hyperreality, except exacerbating the absent presence by proxy. I'll just have you a quick look too, and then we'll go to the website. And I'm almost done also. <laughs> the third mediation, which I will open here. Oops. Can you all see this well? Just let me know at some point uh, if there's a problem to see the website. The third experience is that of the reimagined exhibition, progressively and partially remediated online and accessible from a distance within a totally fabricated dimension, fabricated dimension, that of the total screen that surrounds us today. So you can see uh, objective uh, in, in form of short videos for each artist, you can discover it. I will share the link uh, later too, or someone else 
is motivated to do it right now, um, you can do this. So like the total screen exhibition, the question in the Biennale 2021's title, how we will live together, came well before the pandemic and can be seen as prophetic too. Across its staging, total screen deploys the dramatic side of this question, but with astonishing proposals of the artists also explores its imaginative potential for the times to come. Um, I will now pass uh, the word to Louise and Amandine again. I think Louise wanted to introduce Amandine for really digging deeper into, into the work of the artist. So thank you very much and sorry for having read my text. <laughs> Thank you so much, uh, Katarina. It's a very good uh, introduction to, to the work of, um, of Audriard, of course, but also to uh, some of the uh, underlying issues to the work of uh, our guest tonight, uh, Penelope. But uh, first, I'd like to introduce two of my colleagues who will be uh, discussing uh, with her. Uh, first, uh, well, two of the co-curator who have been very involved and I'm very grateful to them. Uh, as for uh, Katarina and, and Magali, uh, Amandine and Carole have been very involved in, uh, in the, the design and the production uh, of the exhibition uh, at the Design Center, two colleagues from the School of Design. Uh, so first, Amandine uh, is, uh, is a new colleague, uh, recently hired a school. She's a photographer, a designer, uh, and, uh, and a professor. Her research explores the body as an interface in a process of mediation of the message, as well as the way in which digital tools function as spatial and temporal extension of the here and now. Uh, Carole Lévesque, uh, who's also a professor at the School of Design, uh, is a co-founder of the Bureau of the Study of Undisciplined Practices, uh, BP, uh, and she's also a research member of the CELAT, uh, for which um, Katarina is the director. Her work explores questions that pertains to the margins, deviation, and hybrid methods. Uh, she's also uh, an uh, amazing uh, artist also. Uh, she draws beautifully and uh, we've had the chance of having her work exhibiting, exhibited at the Design Center. Um, so I will let them uh, engage in conversation with uh, Penelope Umbrico. Um, thanks, Louise. First, I'm going to introduce um, you to everyone to the work that has been shown in the exhibition but before that thank you very much David Gerstern and Louis Peltier it's not only an honor but it also seems incredibly meaningful for the show Ecran Total to be mediated through the virtual Italian pavilion as I will now comment on pieces that are artist reflection on how we show and see the world through our screens while using everyday virality to broadcast to broadcast my screen here in Montreal onto your screen, probably elsewhere, in multiple, in multiple places in the world. I'm just going to share my screen, so it's a bit fiddly. Okay. Uh, so it's with great pleasure and excitement uh, that I will now introduce you to the work of the seven artists whose pieces revisit Jean Baudrillard's critical thinking on screens and the simulation of realities that not only make possible, but also offer infinite echo for through virality. We will start with the work of Charlie Doyon, who is an artist based in Montreal. Her series, Abstract Bodies, takes the form of photographic portraits of solitary human figures whose identities seem fragmented by domestic screens like TVs and computers and tablets and phones. Um, this series of photographic prints is extended by a performance that took place in the Centre de Design ahead of the show and which you can now see on your screens, ironically. This work highlights the constant shift between virtuality and materiality that we have been experiencing in the past few years and even more so since March, 2020. 
So by materializing the constant back and forth between physical presence and screen mediation, these tangible argentic photographs and this screen-based performance echoes our fragmented selves. We'll just relaunch it. Uh, so our fragmented selves um, were like torn between uh, domestic screen technology and human physicality, and it reflects our current pandemic experience. In his book, Ecran Total, published in 1996, so quite like two decades before the advent of life of sc on screen, as we know it, Jean Baudrillard talked about sleeping on your own life like a data suit. And screens are no longer just an extension of us. They channel the vast majority of our daily experiences and interaction, as it is the case right now, as I'm talking to you. Our identity is scattered amongst different platforms, and we don't expose the same self on LinkedIn, Tinder, Instagram, or in work Zooms. So the half human and half machine cyborg that Doyon creates in her work sets a dystopian vision of the discrepancy between screen technologies and the reality of the human body in its tangible singularity. So this work literally embodies the impact of virtual mediation tools on social relationship and self-perception. With this enigmatic performed portrait like a screen-based Archimboldo allegoric portrait, Charlie Doyon depicts how screens have long started shaping our way of thinking, acting and presenting our distracted and diffracted selves. And while Doyon explores how screens shape our way of being, Chouanier, who I'm going to introduce now, explores how in an era of digital networks, the viral nature of images alters our way of seeing, but equally our approach to creating links between data. With their series Deep Aware Triad, Vivir, 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 which is a pun on Vivir, Spanish for to live, and a stammer version of the word virus, Schwanye aims at visually translating complex systems related to big data. In this triad, Schwanye applies neural network based learning methods to image editing. They deliberately misuse the sensitive filling function of an AI digital brush to merge images from a photographic database constituted of illustration from academic articles about Jean Baudrillard and picture libraries. This diverted tool is associated with other algorithms to create transitional textures content between the found photograph until they take the form of free aggregate composites. The result takes the form of digital paintings or collages built on diagrams inspired by the architecture of artificial neural networks. The final proposal simulates viral systems. And this work is a continuation of Schwanier's media poetry in their quest for a transitional visual language between the coded and the living using metaphors from the field of biology, computer science, and linguistics. Clint Hens, too, explores the notion of virality of online images with his work challenging ethical limits of sharing, possibly oversharing, but also resharing personal images on open source platforms. As you probably know, open source content such as images is released under a license in which the copyright holder grants users the right to use, study, change, and distribute content to anyone and for any purpose. This piece by Clint Hans consists in a 360C uh, timestamped photographs, each marking the day the internet, each marking a day when the internet entered what we called Web 2.0 era. Um, that that year also marked the birth of Flickr, one of the only photo archives from, what from that time that is still readily searchable today. So there on Flickr, Clint Hans gathered his collection of vernacular digital photographs by rummaging through online photographic collections of users who hadn't posted in years. He then assembled them as an eclectic but strictly chronological series. So if you see them in the exhibition, they are all uh, shown together, pretty much like a calendar. So each image stands for a day of the year 2004. So 
the individual images themselves take us back to the beginnings of participative content in the digital age, a, deco a decade before the advent of smartphones. These make us realize how forgiving are our smartphones in their auto balance capture of slick post production, pr production of everyday pictures compared to pocket digital cameras back then with their crude flash and over saturated colors. Carrying a camera around was still a thing then. However, we must remember that until platforms such as Flickr appeared, sharing images mainly happened via email and remained a rather private practice kept within close friends and family. By the excavation and the creation of these digital archeology span artifacts, ENS unearths the social memory of screen images produced and shared by the amateur photographers who participated in the evolution of the internet and in the birth of the digital social, social photography as we know it. Also reusing images gleaned on social media platforms and equally questioning the voyeur approach of one way unsuspected. Oh, sorry, I'm just going to get the sound, the sound usually on this piece. Um, so Mishka and Ernba Simbati also reuse uh, found images from social platforms and um, they devise this installation for Ecran Total. Um, this piece is called Energy Ghost and it is a video installation projected in a circular shape displaying hundreds of sequences of natural disasters that were filmed by surveillance systems, live webcams, or by witnesses phone and share on the social digital networks where Henna and Batty glean them. So by confronting the ubiquity of cameras that captures and screens that broadcast, Henna and Batty questioned the cognitive impact of this constant confrontation to catastrophic situations. These scenes of destruction trick us into an irresistible seduction that is very difficult to evade, revealing a sinister human fascination for utter devastation. The actual piece is about half an hour long and there's sound and music and it's actually very, like, very hypnotic. Often recorded by chance at the very moment these cat catastrophes were triggered, um, these sequences make us realize that nothing anymore escapes the panoptic gaze of the camera, nor the remediation by screen, since experience through image is now our way of apprehending the world. This is where we touch to the notion of surveillance as approached by Baudrillard. In this, in he, in this vision of the world presented to us, and not represented, but really presented uh, through live webcams, for example, everything must be seen and known. There is no event too isolated to be spared from capture and dissemination of a on a large scale, while reducing other events that escape media coverage to silence and obliviousness, as Baudrillard pointed out in his famous and provocative essay, The Gulf War Didn't Take Place, pointing that media representation was limited to humanless propaganda images shot not by photographers, but rather by unmanned cameras attached to planes and laser-guided bombs. Adam Basenta also explores the notion of humanless photography by using a mix of programmed randomness in the making of artworks and artificial intelligence in its validation by the art world. So this piece is called All We'd Ever Need Is One Another it is a mixed media installation that creates images autonomously. It's a continuous running art factory um, with lots of quote marks operating independently of human input. So you can see, you could see just now, uh, there's a light, a flashlight, a flashing light that triggers three flatbed scanners laying on their side into scanning surfaces pointing, pointing at each other. A computer script creates automatic mouse movements, randomizing the settings of the scanning software interface and beginning a scanning process with random color balance, contrast, crop, and so on. So you, you will see the scan a bit better now. Uh, 
So each newly created images is then analyzed by deep learning algorithms that were trained on a database of contemporary artworks in economic and institutional circulation. So when an image matches an existing artwork beyond a similitude of 83%, it is validated as art and uploaded to a dedicated website, Twitter and Instagram account. And occasionally, high ranking matches are printed live at the gallery using a large format printer. So playing on notions of technological automatization, the agency of object, cultural consumption, and the economics of artistic production, Bacenta's installation acts as a self-sufficient mechanism, continuously and mindlessly self-producing without regard for human spectators, but still seeking validation of the art world. So presenting a central feature of this, his artistic approach, the work highlights a certain cultural and economic determinism, passing into the magnifying mirror of algorithms and automation. Quite fascinatingly, we discovered during our opening conversation panel that long before we even started working on Ecran Total, Bacenta's database of contemporary artwork included a piece by Penelope Umbrico, which for us sealed the perfect loop between uh, these two artists presented in the show. So uh, Adam Bacenta and Penelope Imbrico, who had never met until the show, had a lot in common in terms of exploring screens, both um, for their physicality as tools of approximative remediation of images, reinterpreted by the cold lead backlight of the of LCD screens. So this piece of Penelope Umbrico, which I'm going to introduce now, uh, was created especially for Ecran Total. It belongs to a larger body of work called Out of Order. In her own way, Penelope Umbrico deconstructs our relationship to screens by dismantling the smooth surface that we stare at all day, from the minute we wake up, up to the moment we drift into sleep. So Out of Order eBay is a multimedia installation confronting us to the materiality of the screen. So here, the solid interface between the here of our physical position and the there of information, that surface that we are staring at so much and that you are staring at right now, but that we never actually look at for what it is, stands deployed in all its physicality. So in this piece, we have sandwich layers of a liquid crystal display, LCD, so an LCD screen that has been dismantled and suspended as if in a standstill in the midst of implosion or explosion weather. Behind these translucent lenticular surfaces, a functional TV set broadcasts a video made from images and colorful graphic displays cropped from screenshots of faulty TV sets found for sale for their parts on eBay. So by deconstructing our relationship to the physicality of these glass gateways to the outside world, Umbrico seems to question our dependence on a technology subjected to planned obsolescence to satisfy a capitalist logic of consumers culture. So I will now pass on to Penelope Umbrico, who will tell us more about how she explores the materiality of screens in her celebrated practice. Thank you so much, Amandine, and to, and to everybody, um, all the curators and David, um, I'm gonna stand up because there's something going on with my window and light, so. So I'm not in the shadow. Um, I, I just, you're, you're all so articulate about this work, um, so much more so than I am. So I hope I can live up to how you guys speak about it. Um, should I share my screen? Um, get my keynote there. Okay. Uh, <laughs> did you give me permission to share a screen? So is this working? Can you see my screen? Yes, yes, we can. Okay, great. Um, so the other thing that I wanna thank you, I've already thanked you for, but I will thank you again, was just to um, the, the sort of uh, 
what a prompt to go back and reread some of the Baudrillard that I had read 30 years ago. And um, I actually just realized as we, as you were talking that I should have taken a photograph of this particular um, uh, quote because in this book that I've had for, I don't know, 25, 30 years, I underlined this particular uh, section. The enigma of the carcass it's from simulacra, simulacra and simulation, so not from total screen, but uh, in, I'll read it. The enigma of the carcass of flux and signs of networks and circuits, the final impulse to translate a structure that no longer has a name, the structure of social relations given over to an irreversibly deep implosion. Monument to the games of mass simulation functions as an incinerator, absorbing all the cultural energy and devouring it, a bit like a black monolith in 2001. Insane convection of all the contents that came there to be materialized, to be absorbed, and to be annihilated. So he's talking about um, the Pompidou Center there. But for me, um, I, I realized how much of an influence this was, because I've always thought of this as being about the screen about the television. Um, so I, uh, quite a few years after I had read that, I started collecting um, images of TVs on Craigslist because of this very feeling of the absorption that happens in them and um, interested in um, just the idea of exchange. Um, so these are all televisions for sale on Craigslist. Uh, if you don't know what Craigslist is, it's sort of the same as Gumtree in Europe. Um, and um, I just became really fascinated by the um, by the presence of figures in the images and how the this idea of the implosion in this object of a life could be sort of played out. Um, and at the same time that I was uh, collecting these images from Craigslist of TVs. I was also, um, well, these are the cropped images of them. So I took just the screens from them and cropped them. And then um, this is a digital mock-up of, of, of a lot of them. Um, and at the same time as I was doing this work, I was also working on Flickr, um, thinking about what it means to share the same kind of photograph and this idea of, uh, from the paragraph that I read to you, also really applied to me to photography in general. So I was thinking about photography in this way. Um, and what was really striking to me here is that um, these photographs of people, this is so big on the screen, and it's kind of pixelated. I mean, they're pixelated images, but it's also not that clear. I'm gonna to go to the next one. Okay, well, these images of people um, who are sharing their photographs on Flickr of themselves at sunset um, are disappearing. Uh, the technology of the camera is exposing to the sun and that technology then erases the individual. And, um, and I like to show them together, these two projects, actually. So this, these are, this is an installation that I had um, on a wall that was built specifically for the work. On one side were these, um, can you see my mouse? Okay, good. Um, on this side was uh, suns from sunsets from Flickr. And on this side were all the TVs from Craigslist. And why I like to show them together is that on this side, um, in the suns from sunsets from Flickr, all of these people really care about these photographs. So there's this kind of um, assertion of presence in front of the camera and in front of the sunset, um, and it, like, like um, a, an insistence on being there, like a proof that I was there, and yet everybody's disappearing. Um, but they're meaningful to the individuals who are taking them, otherwise they wouldn't be sharing them. So there's a kind of love of these photographs or a sense of subjectivity in these photographs for the individuals, but seen collectively 
they really do all kind of disappear. And then in these photographs, the TVs from Craigslist, these are throwaway photographs. They're only meant to sell a TV. They don't care about the photographs at all. And yet it's in these photographs, uh-oh, um, that's not a good sign, <laughs> that you actually see the individual um, and you see the subjectivity of the individual. And often you see very intimate, very, very intimate um, images reflected in the TVDs. And one of the things that I think is kind of fascinating is in, a, in an image file that's this big um, on Craigslist, you're not very aware of what is actually being reflected in the TV. At least the people in these photographs weren't that aware of what was. So the screen in this case is actually kind of ignored. It's the object that is being sold. And one of the things that I've been thinking about at that time was, um, and I still think about, a lot of my work is driven by this idea. And, and this is where um, the work that I made for Ekran uh, Toto um, comes, develops directly out of this work. Um, thinking about the materiality of the screen and how um, we are not aware of its materiality until it breaks. Um, so we're all looking at a screen right now. You're not thinking about looking at a screen. You're looking at the images I'm showing you. You're looking at each other. We're, um, but, but you don't have a sense of the physical materiality that makes up the screen. Uh, so I started collecting these images. So these are um, files that I, I uh, downloaded from eBay of TVs for sale. Um, and I was at first really sort of yeah, I wanted to make um, I wanted to sort of investigate this idea of the materiality, but I was really struck by the modernist, you know, like some of them had this kind of very beautiful modernist uh, abstraction. Um, so I started just collecting those ones that I could just crop out. And here, here's an example of some of the earliest ones that I made. Um, I, I realized that I was mapping on an aesthetic. Uh, that, like I was interpreting these visual forms as modernist aesthetics, um, when really they're just liquid crystal gone wrong, right? This is an installation that I had a few years ago. And uh, this was an installation at the um, Milwaukee Art Museum that they acquired actually. And I just, I, I liked putting it there because the Milwaukee Art Museum has this kind of very modernist, brutalist architecture. And all of these broken LCD TVs looks like the space that they were being presented in. Um, a lot of the work that I've done around the screen also has to do with um, what's in front of the screen, what's in the screen, and then what's um, behind the screen. So, um, so the TVs from Craigslist are reflections of something that's in front of the screen. The broken sets are in the screen, the materiality of the screen being present. These are um, files that I downloaded from Craigslist of the TV that's actually emitting electronic signal but not saying anything. Um, and so this became a project called Signals Still, where um, I liked that there was a kind of uh, sign, but a sign that we can't understand. Um, that they, they felt like these, these uh, TV screens felt like they were humming and they had some kind of information, but the screen itself became like a sifter where it could only, it couldn't sift through the information that we could understand. And then um, the other part of this then is like what happens when the hand is in the screen. So these are all images of um, laptop and computer monitor screens where the seller has pointed out the flaw by way of some kind of um, um, image authoring software, like little arrows. And um, so in these, in these images, the hand of the seller is actually being presenced in the screen. And then in these images, bodies are in the broken. So these are images where the television has been turned on and you can see bodies in, 
in the broken um, visuals of the, of the LCD. Um, I decided that I wanted to put my own hand in the screen. So I, I, I got this uh, residency. This is at ICAL in Switzerland. And um, I decided I was going to print all of these and some of these um, at this on this um, Heidelberg press. And one of the one of the things that I really wanted to investigate here was the Heidelberg press is like one of the most precise digital. This is a digital one. It's like so precise. And so is the screen. It's so precise. But they're also both really messy. So um, or they can be. So I decided to um, use only paper that they had um, left over. So I'm sort of recycling leftover paper. And then as the rollers were going, I was up in the machine putting ink in myself so that all of the um, all of all of the images, all of the like this is one set of pages, they're all different because they all have this kind of um, hand added uh, printing at like 125, 150% ink density. So this is the book um, that we made there. Um, sometimes there was so much ink, it just completely uh, covered the entire image. This is uh, the same spread, just four different versions of it. So you can see how different each one was. And I just, I really liked the kind of materiality and the sort of liquid messiness of uh, both the printer and the screen in this case. These are some of the pieces that, uh, unique prints that were outtakes from the book. Um, and I realized, you know, at some point that all of my work and everything that I've been doing was mostly in screen and that like looking at a sunset on screen you're not looking at sunlight, you're looking at screen light. Um, so I actually made this uh, video. Let's see, is it gonna play? I think my computer, it's doing some, it's not, okay, it's not gonna play. It's a video of, of, um, of it's a video of a very slow dissolve between different suns and um, images that I found online. And then I re recorded it with my iPhone on the screen. So the moray in the video um, allows the, well, sort of makes the sun sort of go in and out of the screen. Like sometimes it disappears and sometimes, um, but it's not going to play for us. So, oh, there we are. So the, the, the sun disappears and then reappears. Um, okay, we'll skip this. And the other thing I started to do was thinking, okay, well, if the sun is out there and the screen is here and it's emitting light, what does it look like inside the screen? Like, how can, like, can I reverse that relationship? Can I, can I have the sunlight come through the screen rather than screen light through the sun? So I started to disassemble screens. So these are some screens that I disassembled. Here are some screens. <laughs> Uh, very different screens. These are LCD TV screens. These are monitor screens. Um, these are laptop screens. And I started UV printing on them, the images of the broken screens. Um, so this is a bunch of laptop screens that have printed on them um, broken screens. This is a big LCD TV that has um, its, its broken image printed on it. Um, and another one. And with the lap, with the monitor screens, I realized at some point, so I scanned them and I wasn't really interested in these as scans, but, but what happened when I um, put them on my, <laughs> so I had a scan of a screen on my computer monitor. And as I made it larger and mar larger, a moray pattern would happen between the, the, the image of the screen and the screen it was on. So this is one image at different um, at different scales. It says sixty seven percent, but it's just I'm just pulling the image up. Um, so I decided that and you know I've always been fascinated by moray patterns, um, 
they're so beautiful, but in my mind, I have to have a kind of a better reason than just the beauty of something to make a project around it. And I realized at some point, oh, this is screen talking to screen. This is a language I do not understand, which is partly what makes it so mysterious and beautiful, but it's, it's actually a communication between two screens. So um, here's uh, what, they, what a lot of them looked like. I made this big installation in Switzerland um, of, I forget how many were in this installation, but they, I printed them all out. Um, um, and I called this project Screen to Screen. And then I also, in, in this studio actually, I put um, a bunch of the screens that I had taken apart in the window. And at a certain time, um, the sun just comes straight through. So these are photographs of the screen, of, of multiple screens with the sun coming through them. And then me just photographing that. Oh, this was like the same exact thing, but like two minutes apart as the sun was setting. Um, and then I did this other project where I put a, an, another way of sort of exploring what sunlight and screen light could have something to do with each other. I put uh, the screens on a flatbed scanner and took the top off. And when the sun was shining on the scanner, I was scanning the, the screen. So basically I was making a hybrid scan um, photogram kind of. Um, and that the scanner was actually, the scanner light and the screen light were meeting in the screen. So these are the images that resulted from that, that dialogue between scanner light and screen light. I'm sorry, scanner light and sunlight in, in the materiality of the screen. And I loved that it sort of, it picked up these kinds of refractions of the light and that refraction within the screen really, um, illuminated all of the history of the screen. And one of the things that we also have to think about when we're thinking about screens is we're so intimate with our screens, right? Like they're the first thing we look at when we get up in the morning probably. And the last thing we look at when we go to sleep, they, they're with us all the time. So there's something about um, the intimacy and the history here and all the flaws and the reason that these screens are all, um, you know, I, I did not take apart screens that was that were working, right? So they have the history of their deflation and defunctness in them. Uh, this was an installation at the New York Public Library of all of these. Um, and then I also started working with the modularity of the screen. I, I really do love this idea that this kind of modernist invention, the screen, when it breaks, it it reflects a kind of modernist aesthetic. And so all of the, uh, the modularity of the insides of the screen here come together to hold it, uh, hold it together. Um, and the entire installation is very precarious because I wanted this kind of precarity around, you know, like the viewer really navigating a physical object that is precarious, actually. And um, so here we have the bezels of the screen and the interior is holding up. There's magnets inside, they're all holding up. Um, and they're sitting on top of screen box, like boxes from um, TV boxes. This is a little video, I hope it'll play. It'll just, one of the other things about this work and is very evident in the work at, to at Total Screen Exhibition is the animated, the animating quality of um, these screens is not going to play, <laughs> or it will eventually. But as you move through it, different things, like you can see here in the still, that this image is being refracted out onto that image. Oh. And then I did this, let's see, we can skip that and you can see this. Oh, here it is. Okay. So um, the screen itself kind of has this way of sort of ricocheting out an image from so that's, yeah. Um, and this was an installation where I pulled the screen apart and these high school students just got so into it. Like they were like jumping around and taking pictures of each other. And this was an installation at um, Brick where I actually, it's uh, 
in Brooklyn, I, I installed 42 broken LCD TVs and live streamed the news to them. And um, I also had a, um, so this was a live performance of these broken TVs. And then behind it, so this is the installation behind it, you can see here, I had this big table and I invited people to come and take apart screens and devices. And as they got taken apart, I would like put different elements throughout the space. Um, so this is what I ended up with from the TVs that we took apart. And then I also added some things that I already had. Um, and this is what it looked like most days um, because there was a school close by, so a lot of high school students came. The reason I'm showing you this though is that I am really interested in this idea of the black box and turning these devices that we're so intimate with that we hardly understand as material objects, turning them inside out, getting a sense of what is inside them. Um, so this actually became, uh, I, I took a uh, camera and it live streamed to, um, YouTube and you could watch it. You could watch people taking things apart if you, if you knew about it. You can see here there's no, one person was watching and there are no followers, so um, no subscribers. So I, I, this was at the beginning, so. And then um, we took, I, I encouraged people to lay things out and you could take a picture of the stuff. So um, I called this a knolling table. Um, it's after, um, forget who what it was that coined that term, but it's uh, in reference to Knoll, the design company. And um, I also took my favorite parts of these and made these very stark uh, silhouetted images of them and made uh, temporary tattoos. Oops. I don't know what's going on here. Why is it not? It's being very, very slow and here we are. Here's, here are the temporary tattoos. Um, I tried to put one on, but <laughs> I did these a couple of years ago. Temporary tattoos do not last very long. Um, but I, what I liked about these tattoos is they, um, it's, it's about taking something that's inside your device, your iPhone, and putting it on the exterior of your skin. So again, a kind of interior, exterior, inside out relationship to black boxes. And then this is a project where I put a CRT television inside a flat screen TV. So um, I always think, it, I call it pirouette for CRT and it's a bunch of, um, it's a bunch of CRT televisions that I found on Craigslist for sale and I sequenced them in various positions so that they could turn. Um, a pirouette is like a swan song. It's like the, the last dying dance. But I always think of this also as um, the LCD TV is pregnant with its precursor because <laughs> it's like it's got this like volumetric thing going around in it, but it's a very flat, thin surface. And then um, another insertion of the TV in the TV is the piece that I have at Total Ecran. Um, and so one of the things that I was interested in here was, first of all, the video. And um, maybe I will, can I, can you see my entire screen here? Okay, so I'm gonna play you this, this video. Um, that, so it's, I, I think I said 113 images, I can't remember, um, are in this of broken LCD TVs. And I sequenced them very slowly um, together. What I wanted to do was out of the multiple images to create this kind of singular modernist kind of video, but I also, um, I'm interested in this, this phenomenon that sometimes it feels as though the, the image itself is moving, um, like things move across the screen. Sometimes it feels as though your eyes may be playing tricks on you. So it was really about sort of the perception of the screen and how sometimes, you know, we get these kind of after effects that are in our eyes and it's not the screen. And so to confuse our physical perception of it with what it actually is. Um, 
Okay, so I'm gonna go back to this. So that is playing very slowly on this monitor. And as you move around, you see that it kind of disappears. Um, yeah. So that's the idea was to sort of, was to create this kind of shift, um, this, this kind of shift between the technology that's presenting the image and the image itself and the screen and how um, it, it's very, you know, like sometimes you don't see the image, the image itself becomes precarious. Yeah. So I will end there. Stop sharing screen. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you, Penelope, for this um, wonderful presentation and extended version of what um, we were able to see when we opened the show and you showed us some of these projects, but this is a much more expanded version. So it's it's really nice. Thank you for this generosity in showing so many uh, so many projects tonight. Um, well, for the opportunity to show the projects. Yeah, it, it gives more context also to the piece that's in the exhibition and that yeah. uh, uh, Amandine talked about a bit more at length mm -hmm. before you, you showed us your projects. Um, just so the, the audience uh, is aware, we'll, we'll be taking some questions. So perhaps you want to, um, to start thinking about, or you probably already have questions to ask Penelope, um, but perhaps um, if you have questions, you can write them in the chat box uh, and not raise your hand because it, then it, it changes the sequence of screens and it, it messes things up a little bit. Uh, but before we, we take uh, questions from the audience, uh, I do have um, a few questions that I would like, like to ask you. I won't ask probably them all or too many as to give you enough time to answer and also to give the chance to people in the audience to, to ask for more questions. Um, but I would like to ask you a couple of questions in, in, in uh, terms of towards to gear sort of the conversation towards materiality. You talked about materiality a little bit more towards the end and I, I'm not sure if chronologically the later projects you showed in your presentations are the closest to us in time. Uh, but this question of materiality seems to uh, to, to take an important place in your work um, and then the piece that's in the exhibition for sure is probably, it seems to me, perhaps the most three-dimensional uh, piece perhaps that, that uh, you've made. I, I might be wrong, you can tell me if that's so, but um, so I'm, I'm sort of uh, curious about this, this paradox between speaking of images and screen and absence and, you know, sort of ghost-like figures and the physical presence uh, which your, your piece in the show confronts us with. So it's, there's always the sort of conversation between things that are not real yet. You print on screens, you, you, right. you, you throw ink to print images of screens. So there's this, this, this paradox really in between the two. And you choose different mediums to express this paradox. Sometimes it's, it's photos, sometimes it's movies, sometimes it's a real physical thing. And I was just curious, really, this is just um, to satisfy my curiosity, how you go about choosing the presence of the image. So are there some images that are more, um, let's say, are, are closer to uh, one medium than others, or are some mediums uh, more perhaps able to show the presence of a certain set of images? Um, and so I'm, I'm in terms of process, I'm kind of curious as how, how you decide what kind of level of presence you choose to give the different images. It's a really good question because, um, I mean, I've done quite a bit of thought about this, but I also, it's like there's so much, uh, well, okay, I'll, I'll <laughs> It's a, you know, it's one of those things where I'll be working with something and um, the logic of the 
of the image itself, the logic of the subject will kind of dictate what it should be. So um, the, the four by six snapshots of those disappearing figures in the sunset portraits, um, when I first started that project, um, how people had images were four by six snapshots, right? So it made sense to actually materialize them that way. Um, the, uh, the first prints that I made of the broken LCD TVs, I decided I could make them as sort of standard conventional C prints because they had this kind of modernist quality. I wanted them to be kind of big modernist photographs. And then at some point, the idea of e-waste and how, you know, that the project that I did at Brick was the second actually e-waste kind of project that I did. Um, but the idea of the material that's obsolete and that we're like filling our land fills with like how many, like, I don't know, 90,000 tons of e-waste every day or something like <laughs> that. Uh, I don't know what the numbers are, but it's a lot. And so, you know, questioning, well, maybe use this stuff rather than print on new stuff. So th the materiality of the television itself and sort of trying to un understand its physical presence in my life became a way of thinking about, well, okay, first I have to navigate the thing. You know, first we have to actually wrestle with it. Actually, I. I you know, the television as a subject, like how many of you have had a CRT television, one of those big ones, you know, sitting in the basement for months because it's too heavy to haul out onto the street or, you know, what do you do with it? It's poisonous. You know? So there's something um, so physically awkward and cumbersome about these technologies, especially the older ones. and. Um, when I had started making that work, I remember um, I, I realized a big influence was this book, um, As I Lay Dying by Faulkner. Um, and I really think there's a kind of good connection between, <laughs> between that and this work in a sense where um, I read it so long ago, but there's this kind of um, the grandmother who's about to die is watching her son build her her casket and it's told from all these different points of views in the family and then she dies and they put him in the put her in the casket and then they drive across country in the middle of the summer with a body in the back of the station wagon and it starts to stink and swelter you know it, it's just the most disgusting, <laughs> uh, you know, imaginable kind of content context. And I think of these technologies that we are so engaged in and, and you know, um, they are, they've entangled us in this way, in this very profound way. And so um, the materiality of it is always present. Like I, I wouldn't, it wouldn't be interesting to me to, you know, focus on something that isn't that doesn't have that kind of layer. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I don't yeah. think that answered your question at all. But <laughs> yeah, oh, yes. it's, uh, it's perfect. But it also brings me to the to a question in regards to your piece and the exhibition again with this where we're confronted with uh, the layers of the of the lcd screen which we never get to see and we don't even think that there might be several layers to this thing it seems like right. just uh, one object um but this exhibition is is well it's unusual for many reasons, one of which is that we uh, we put the exhibition thinking that no one would see it. Um, so that was already something a bit strange to think about how you, you put together a show that no one will ever get to, to lay foot in. Uh, but for you, I think especially is, is also unusual um, since you've never seen our gallery uh, and you will not be able to travel to Montreal to see the show before we dismantle it. Um, yet you you still chose to to create a new piece for this show, and so you created a very physical, um, uh, three dimensional work for an exhibition that only exists for you in images, a place that only exists through descriptions and images. Um, and so 
I was wondering if if how you think about this again this other uh, this paradox again where um, the idea of of building or uh, a three dimensional installation for a space that only exists through images and that now that your piece is installed you also only can see your piece in the space through images and so there's like this this kind of russian doll of yeah. images and physicality that that really becomes kind of complicated in a way so i don't know how what you think about this situation yeah, it's interesting also because that the um that the video that I made is a very slow changing video. And I realized, you know, halfway through the exhibition that to, to show it as a documentation, it has to be faster because, because the documentation is like a split second of something rather than a 15 minutes of something or 30 minutes of something. So, um, so I've actually made so many versions of that video now that are for various ways of showing the piece, but not the piece, right? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's, it's funny because I have started like for the last few years, I've been making digital mock-ups of cultural installations, or, you know, installations not particularly like yours, but um, uh, I, but I've actually worked, I work always on the screen and I've made digital mockups of flat installations and then sculptural installations I've started to work through. And one of the things that I've learned is that, you know, flat is different than sculptural and you never really know what it's going to be like. And so the, the original piece that we were thinking about when we, when I realized there's no way I could be there to help install it. Mm -hmm. um, and it's just such a complicated piece. And then you know, it would it would really not um, translate well in documentation. So that's when I thought, okay, well, if you're, I, I guess I guess for me, all of my work is site specific, and so since the site changed, I really wanted to change it. But mm -hmm. uh, but I haven't, you know, like every show that I've been in since the pandemic, I haven't seen. So <laughs> it's really sad. Yeah, it's really <laughs> sad. It's sad, but then it's it's kind of a happy you know it's kind of happy that shows do still happen uh, yeah. so yes, yes. <laughs> there there's an upside to it but i'm i'm glad to hear you say uh this because it kind of linked to to this question i was wondering about whether there can be a real connection between images and, and broken images of screens and all this and yeah. in a in a situated physical place and this sort of dialectic between the actual real world and the world of these things that we see without really looking at. And it's so really, how, yeah. yeah, it's such a great, I mean, your ideas about how to, you know, almost separate the virtual aspect of the exhibition and the exhibition itself is like so perfect for this subject, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Really great. Thank you so much, Penelope. Maybe I haven't looked at the, um, at the chat box and I think that uh, for those of you who are uh, looking on uh, YouTube um, you can also write down questions and we might uh, be able to relay them to Penelope um, so I haven't had a chance I was so captivated by your presentation and answers that I haven't looked at the chat box yet uh, so I don't know if perhaps someone who's on zoom with us who would like to to ask a question to Penelope would like to open their mic um, and ask a question there's a question here that says oh sorry oh, no go ahead well, uh, the, it sort of is related to um, the question that you asked, Louise, and that is um, how important is the act of, oh, it was uh, Louis Charles Lassnier. Yeah. <laughs> Louis Charles, yeah, a colleague here at the. How important is the act of exhibiting the work in a gallery exhibition space? Um, you know, and I think it's kind of relevant to what, oh, I guess, Carol, you were asking. Um, relevant to that question, and that is that it's really important because it's just an artistic process thing where if you don't have an audience, the work just never gets tested, right? And so there's an element of testing 
that's really, really important. Um, and even knowing that it will have an audience, but not actually being able to see it, <laughs> actually still functions as a test. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's, have you considered making a exhibition, um, online exhibitions? Like where, you know, for the past year, museums and galleries have tried to figure out how to have online exhibitions. It's, it's is, funny, is this something you could consider as a, as a type of exhibition to have it online? I think it's so strange that, that online exhibitions take the form of actual sort of in real life exhibition spaces. And it seems so ridiculous to me. It's like, there is no floor online, right? There's no ceiling. There's no limit to the size of the wall that you could have online. So, you know, I just, I find the whole sort of online exhibition thing. So I have, I've made um, three, I've made two different projects. One with the TVs from Craigslist, where I've just compiled all of them that I've ever, ever downloaded. So, um, so it's a, a file with um, three thousand. I think there's like three thousand something images in it, but and it's huge. So when you see the entire thing on your screen, they're tiny, tiny, tiny little images. But you can actually zoom in. So as you zoom in, you know the the piece becomes kind of like uh, like a cosmos. And, and you can zoom into all the different, like I showed you all a few of the pieces that had a lot of really interesting detail in them. So you can zoom into them this way and then you can zoom back out and sort of like magic going in and out. Um, and it could never ever be realized in real life, right? Because it would take up, it would be like 500 feet tall by 800 feet long, you know, I don't know, just, and you wouldn't be able to get up there to see the details in the ones that were in the top. So it's just, it's definitely a screen-based piece. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, and then I'm doing another project on SketchUp, which is a, I haven't finished it yet, but it would be definitely just a, a, a screen work, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, it'd be uh, it'd be uh, amazing to see this uh, 800 feet long <laughs> image well, you somewhere. You can see it actually. <laughs> it's uh, yeah. I I think I have it on my website. I'm not sure, but it takes a really long time to load. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. If I may just take a few seconds, um, you um, you mentioned uh, Penelope that you. Unfortunately, you haven't been able to see the uh, the exhibitions or the, the the art pieces that you've produced. And there are some uh, comments in the chat. And I I have to say uh, during your your talk, I did receive some texts and emails also of people ha who have seen the exhibition uh, at the Design Center, and um, and the comments are uh, really unanimous about. Uh, the impact uh, of of your work and and it's not really a question it's more of a comment uh, what I find uh, remarkable also personally about your work uh, is uh, is how it invites us and and forces us in a way to uh, to take into account this materiality of the screens and uh, it forces us to almost take a step back from these screens that we've been staring at uh, for months and months yeah. and and your ability to reveal some kind of beauty through the broken or through the disregarded uh, and that I find very uh, very moving and uh, I, I just want to say thank you for, for thank the beauty you. of your work <laughs> I see that Lisa is asking a question uh, would you like to formulate it uh, Turn on your camera and join us. <laughs> I'm putting you on the spot. Yeah, sure, I can. Hi, Louise, and thank you, Penelope. Really beautiful work. Um, so I was struck while you, while you were talking, while I was very struck by the work, but also noticing like while you're speaking, there's the reflection in the eyeglasses yeah. while you're speaking. So there's this additional mediation. Yeah. I get that as well. But then it made me think about, you know, what what might we bring back to our thinking about face-to-face -face encounters and the experience um, 
the so-called unmediated experience. I was thinking that even like the pupils of our eyes catch those reflections. And I know that in ancient Greece, Empedocles talked about the, the film of our, the pupil of our eye as a kind of screen. Right. <laughs> so I'm just That's curious interesting. Yeah. what resonates or what, what you bring back to the face-to-face -face encounters after the total screen, or is that part of the process? What, I'm sorry, what was the last part of the well, question? Just, is, is that even part, part of your process? It might be something I'm projecting onto it, but what do you bring back to the face-to-face -face encounter? What do I bring back to the what? To the face-to-face -face encounter. Oh, oh, sorry. <laughs> it's, I have this weird air conditioning system. I've actually blocked it off because it gets so cold in here and it's so loud in here. I can hardly hear anything. I <laughs> should really concentrate. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that one of the, th I mean, this is going to sound really off the wall compared to like in relation to what you're asking, but or tell it speaking about. But um, a lot of the work that I have done in the last uh, 20 years, I think, has also sort of, you know, been thinking about the web itself as being, um, you know, when we're on when we're online inter interacting with people or sort of communicating, we're, we're having this kind of parallel relationship with each other. And actually Zoom is the first one where the, the first, you know, since COVID, we've actually been confronted with ourselves in a way that we have never been, like I'm, I can see myself right now talking. It's like, oh my God, this is what I look like. You know, so there's this kind of confrontation, like you're all, you're all there facing me, right? Um, so that's a really different experience. You know, it's like in some ways more face to face than we were before COVID um, when we were online. Um, and I, I think that there's an element of, um, you know, people said that postmodernism was a schizophrenic cultural time. And, and I sort of think of post, post, you know, like post internet as being a kind of autistic time where we're kind of not ever really looking at each other. We don't have this kind of, um, yeah. And so maybe we're moving into that kind of place, right? Where we don't have, physical intimacy with most of the people that we know. Like there are people that I've met in the last year and a half that I feel really close to, I've had really great conversations to, but I've actually never physically met them. Yeah, so I don't know. I mean, I think that that's, it's really interesting, but yeah. yeah thanks a lot. It opens up some really interesting questions. You know, there's a, a, a few things I wanted to share. Very. Can, can you speak up a little because it's oh, really yes, air conditioning <laughs> alert. Yeah. I'm gonna yell. <laughs> okay. uh, no, there's a few things. I, I love your work. I, I I'm very uh, moved uh, by it, inspired by it. Uh, I think it brings up uh, you know really remarkable um, questions of 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 our time of now, and and of course an incredible conversation with uh, what Bujalard was hinting at. <laughs> you know, and, yeah. and, and others. Um, yeah. I was thinking of but Bujalard and Bataille, you know, this kind of conversation between George Bataille and, and Bujalard uh, across decades, of course. Um, but anyway, I just, there were three things that I wanted to say really, really short. One, of course, the question of have you seen the show? You know, have you seen your show? It's a really great question. Or, you know, <laughs> if you've Zoomed with somebody, have you seen them? Um, yeah. It's the same question uh, uh, of have you seen your show? And it's the question that it's in it's implicit in what your work is asking um i love the sunlight uh, screen light conversation because i think you're you're in, in that um in addition i mean obviously the materiality work you're doing but the sunlight screen light you know uh positions the enigma of the cave of our time you know, I mean, you know, we're, we are, we're still in the caves. It's just in the cave. cave. Right, right. You know? and, and I both mean, I mean, Plato, but I also mean the cave drawings. I mean, I mean, you know, it, it, it's the, all the enigmas of, of Plato in the cave, but it's also like, what is it to, um, 
what's the deep relationship between us looking at the screen or surface of a cave? And I mean, you know, 100,000 years ago, you know, we know that whoever made those drawings, you know, a friend of mine, Tom Zimmer, great philosopher of, 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 of these questions, he said to me one day, what if those uh, what if those drawings weren't made by our ancestors, but by bears? By what? By bears. <laughs> and it's such an interesting thing. We, it's The humor in it is that we have this innate understanding that whoever made them, we consider them us. <laughs> you know, like, you know, they're, they're human. And the reason we do that is, is important. It's because we, are, we recognize that drawing, surface, image, representation, all of that is is so innately linked to our being. You know, the, the, yeah. the nature of human nature is inseparable from that. So that's why it's funny to imagine bears making those drawings. So I so one I wanted to say I think that the caves, like the you know the caves of our time. I mean, in in fifty thousand years, we are obviously you know in the caves now. Um, the other thing I wanted to share, and, and, and I... What's interesting about what you're saying, actually, is I don't know that anything that we're making now will last that long. <laughs> right? Oh, absolutely. So there's also that, but yeah. Oh, God. I mean, I, I don't think we could even project out 10 years or 50 years <laughs> and, and imagine the, the, the complex geographies that, you know, will be, or people will be inhabiting, the human condition yeah. will be inhabiting. I mean... A hundred years is kind of mind-boggling to imagine uh, forward, um, but you know, of course, time. I mean, that's the part of the enigma. There is the relational nature of temporality, so that you know, in the caves, drawings were drawn over five thousand years, you know, and and now, <laughs> you know, entire civilizations happened in a thousand years, you know. Um, uh, but to the materiality thing, I have to I have to say something about. <laughs> Philo Farnsworth. The what? Philo Farnsworth. I don't know if anyone here has ever heard of Philo Farnsworth, but it's impossible not to mention him given the, your work and what you just shared. Philo is a completely unique figure. Philo Farnsworth invented the television, invented the television and, and, and the ones that you were sharing before pre flat screen digital TV. Right, the the the, 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 the tube, the tube the television, nineteen mm -hmm. twenties, and what I love about this story, I'm going to do the shortest, like thirty five second version of Philo. I can. He was a mathematical genius, and he was a farmer, and he was a t a child genius, essentially a child mathematical savant, but he never went to school. He was a farmer, and one of the great challenges in making you know, the early attempts at, at making the television, there was a serious challenge, which was that the electrical impulse, the strength of it necessary to create the, the, an image that could be trans, you know, transmitted. It, the, the way they were doing it, it was so, it, it had to be so strong so that it could communicate that it would basically explode whatever they made at the other end, you know, like it would blow up the tube, it would blow up the screen. Like there was no way for it to land without destroying where it was landing. Now, Philo had spent his young life in the fields, tilling the land, you know, like cutting rows for planting on a farm, you know, so to the end of one row and back again you know, from the song. And he was about 15 or 16, you know, because there was like a, 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 a community college math professor had heard about this kid on, a, on the farm that like had this insane math capacity. So went out there and started visiting him and working with him and they became friends and like that that was you know how this so at 15 or 16 philo had an epiphany about breaking the electrical signal of the light waves into rows oh, across nice. the screen back and forth and recreate the equation right the image and it, so he could reduce the you know the little power of each moment of little milliseconds. He called it the uh, image dissector. <laughs> it would dissect the image into little bits and it worked. I mean, mathematically, the electrical impulses now were not blowing up the tubes. Um, and that's how TVs worked until the, the flat screen. 
it's kind of incredible. So what I'm saying is the horizontal geography, the caves, right? The horizontal geography that he had lived in and all that embodied experience, the materiality of it all, you know, became the vertical geography that we live in now. He just he like rotated uh, to the vertical. That's great. That's really quite beautiful to think about it. Yeah. And I think you're in there. I mean, you're between the caves and Philo. You know what I mean? Like you're, that history is what you're uh, uh, I'm playing it. I'm playing with it. <laughs> yeah. It is brilliant as Philo. <laughs> now, and the last thing is just a one <laughs> A one sentence quote from John Hayduck, who was a who was my mentor and a great figure. Uh, just you know, one sentence that I heard fragments of about five times during this, so I, I have to share it. Um, he said, "There is the possibility of an architecture that could be understood as a fabrication. As it is constructed, it disappears." Okay. I mean, it's so insanely beautiful. David, on this wonderful, beautiful metaphor of the great master, John Haydick, I would like to thank you again most sincerely for making uh, this encounter, this meeting possible with uh, all these wonderful friends and colleagues. Uh, thank you for being here tonight. Thank you to uh, our guest, Penelope. An immense thank you to the team of curator who have done an amazing work in uh, imagining, developing, producing this exhibition at the Design Center. Um, for those of you who might be in this area, <laughs> It's still on until Sunday. So if you have a chance, please come and visit. Um, I am not objective, of course, but I think it's a very, very uh, beautiful exhibition uh, and stimulating at the highest degree uh, intellectually and for all sorts of reasons from every point of view. So uh, thank you all for being here tonight and for sharing with us this, uh, this project. Uh, thank you, Penelope. And thank you so much for having we, me. We, we have to find a way to bring you to Montreal eventually yeah. and meet in person. And I hope we'll, we all get a chance to, to meet you uh, as well uh, in I one way so or another. I hope so too, I hope so too.